Hey there, and thanks for tuning in to Squatch Radio. My name is Connor Malley, and I'm your host. Before we get into today's show, I wanted to share a little bit about me and why Squash Radio exists. So I've been a passionate squash player for almost 20 years, but what makes my path slightly different from your average squash player is I've also made squash my career. I've worn almost every hat and worked in almost every role in the industry. Some quick examples are I've gone from being a volunteer at a professional event to then becoming the CEO of the US Open. I've gone from trying to make Team USA to then becoming the director of all national teams while working at US Squash. And I've certainly gone from just playing on squash courts to focusing on how the sport can grow in the United States. What has been a big part of fueling my passion all these years are the fascinating, passionate, and dedicated people involved in our sport. So Squash Radio, well, that's just a way to try and help share those stories. We hope you like it, and if you're interested in growing the sport, get in touch. Or can you help share these stories? Comments are welcome on any social media, or email us at squashradio at gmail.com. That's squashradio at gmail.com. Our biggest challenge is always trying to get the word out, so any help is so much appreciated. Without further ado, please enjoy the show. What about this? This call is being recorded. For some quick background on our guests in this episode, here's a quick overview. We speak with Jesse Engelbrecht, who's originally from Zimbabwe, but now lives in London, England. Like many people in squash world, Jesse wears a lot of hats, from being a coach to running his various businesses. But his main focus is on developing squash players, from first-time players all the way to elite athletes on the professional tour. There are two key ways that Jesse separates himself from the rest of the field. First, he has spent thousands of hours learning and studying mental toughness and the ways that squash players can improve their game and lives by incorporating these lessons. Second, Jesse's also an entrepreneur at heart and is involved in lots of different ventures. But his latest venture is a perfect blend and application, pun intended, of the wealth of his knowledge. He has released Squash Mind, which is a coaching tool or app in your pocket. It's designed on how you can practice and develop mental toughness, which is a key part of success for any player at any level. You can try it for yourself. The links are on our posts, or you can go directly to squashmind.co.uk. Go check it out. Like always, we cover a wide range of topics, and we hope you enjoy the conversation. Last note, I do apologize in advance about the sound quality on my microphone. I've had some nagging issues, and while I could only clean up the episode so much this time around, going forward, I believe we got it solved. All right, here we go. Hey there, Squash fans. Welcome back to another episode of Squash Radio. I'm your host, Connor O'Malley, and we have an amazing guest today. So excited. We had to reschedule, but I'm glad we did because I think it's going to be worth everyone's while here. So calling in from across the pond is Jesse Engelbrecht, and uh, originally from Zimbabwe, but calling in from just outside London. So welcome to the show. Cool. Uh, Connor, how's it, man? Yeah, like uh, glad that we could reschedule. Uh, we had a good game plan to start with, but it's going to make it even better now, I bet. Yeah. And, you know, already we've known each other less than two hours, three hours, I yep. would say, but I do have to send this across. I like a ton of respect. I love what you're doing over there. And Thank that you. was part of and, and also just reaching out. And I think that's a good lesson of just, you know, if you want something, ask or reach out. So No, it's, well, been in the short time we, we've chatted, I think our conversations have taken so many different diverging paths. And it, it sounds like we're probably going to continue these uh, after the podcast and in the future, which is always exciting. I like that. So we're here for many different reasons. But one is um, the work that you're doing. And you have a, an exciting product, uh, products, I should say, but uh, we'll spend time on both. But Give the cocktail version when you're meeting someone or at the pub. Uh, <laughs> and they say, oh, hey, Jesse, what do you do? So I suppose the, the easy broad answer is a squash coach. You know, you used to be a pro player for a number of years. I enjoyed that, loved touring the world and playing. And it was always just quite a quite a curious person. I think I would get into something and, and try go deep with it and investigate and, and be curious and and then naturally went into the coaching side of things and, and to fast forward things pretty quickly just in bringing 
like up to speed now. Yeah, I've been really excited to launch Squash Mind, which is it started off as audio recordings on SoundCloud, which was designed to help my players work on their mental side of the game. So to give them visualization techniques, mindfulness techniques, talking about different tactics and game plans, and really trying to it might sound a bit cheesy and cliche this, but I like it. it. It was the gym of the mind. You know, I think we all are super aware of the physical side of the game and how important that is and the movement and the technique and getting on court and hitting balls. But how often are we exercising our mind? So yeah, it actually started in lockdown. It was the whole idea with, I'm not able to see my players. I was in South Africa for three months of the lockdown. Um, couldn't get back to the UK. And a few of my players reached out and were like, great, we can, you know, tap balls against the wall. We can do some skills. We can go for runs. But you know what? The mind is a big part of the game that we're not doing any work on. So it, it formed from that. And, and again, a, a great shout out to um, young Oliver, one of my students who reached out and he was the one who planted the seed. And it's just grown from there. Uh, it seemed like it was taken up nicely on SoundCloud. And it was a little bit of a messy platform. It wasn't easy to initially do what I wanted with it. So the idea came, you know what, I want to get this in an app and have something that's really easily accessible for players to have on their phone. You know, everyone's got a smartphone these days to pull it out and to listen to anything from a two minute mindfulness lesson up to like a 20 minute deep visualization on all parts of the game. So that was the little brainchild. And yeah, it's been great. It officially launched at the beginning of November, but there was a whole bunch of stuff happening in the background before that. And yeah, the uptake's been good. So yeah, that's the, <laughs> you said give a short uh, answer. Okay. <laughs> that's that's, that's a, a rough, quick snapshot of it. No, no, no. I mean, this is really exciting stuff. This personally resonates uh, deeply in, for what you're working on and, and so many streams coming together for me. But one question, which is, I've never asked this to someone, but I'd just be curious, like if you weren't mm -hmm. going to be, you are a squash coach is how you describe yourself. But let's just say alternative universe. Yeah. You do snap your fingers and do anything. And let's say money's not an issue. Okay. What do you think you might be doing? Good question. Um, this is probably not the answer, but as soon as I finished my pro squash career, I didn't want to see squash at all. So I went back to South Africa and me and a mate uh, got into the restaurant business and really loved that side of it. The social side, the planning side. Again, three or four months in, I was like, I need to get back. I love squash. I love doing it and playing it and passing on information. But then I think for me, I don't know, I just, I love the concept of, I suppose, things I'm curious in and things I know that work and researching it and then putting them across in a really simple way. So something along those lines where in probably an education piece or something along where I, I just like to help people with things they might be struggling with, whether it's mental things. I know that links to squash mind and I'm not doing it to just link it there. It genuinely is something I, I'll read something on the Stoics or some quote Marcus Aurelius used to write and going, Hey, you know what, what's my interpretation of that? And can I put it across? Um, I've been lucky enough to be told I'm, I'm quite a good communicator and I seem to communicate well. And I think that comes across in, in the coaching. And I, I think you need to be as a coach. Was that always from an early age or is this a skill that you worked on? I definitely think there was a naturalness and, at an early age, but yeah, if I look back at my first few years of coaching, they weren't very good. And I'll give you a quick example here. Someone approached me, I was, I was probably been playing on the turf for five years and they, they talked about, oh, you've, you've got a really great forehand drop shot. I really want to play your drop shot. I was like, brilliant. Okay. Of course I can teach this. I completely hashed it. I had no idea how to get my point across to something I did very naturally. And I remember that lesson so clearly. The guy came at the end and he gave me the money. And I actually turned around and said, I'm sorry, I can't take your money because I've actually ruined your drop shot. <laughs> I've completely destroyed your game. And I've told you so much information that's not even relevant. But it was probably one of my most formative lessons that got me reflecting a lot, thinking, yeah, you know what? If I'm going to teach someone, I need to be able to get my point across in a simple-ish kind of way that is going to be impactful. And, you know, so... I think that really got me interested in coaching that, like I said, was while I was still a, a pro player. And yeah, throughout the years, I've then probably honed it and chipped away at that craft in regard to the communication and getting the points across and, you know, feel really honored to work for squash skills and be on their platform a lot and, and be asked to do videos. And, you know, lucky enough when one of a few of my videos goes up that the views and the comments are, are, are relatively high. And I'm thinking, wow, okay, well, you've got Nick Matthew and Terry Linku and David Palmer talking about this stuff, but people seem to like what I talk about. So I think there was an initial thing when I was a kid, I was very you know, chatty and, and just very open and, and an extrovert. 
But yeah, I definitely think it's then a skill that got honed over the years because of that one first lesson on that forehand drop that I completely botched. I mean, so many of the things that you said, it's almost like I've had a similar experience. And so it's just, it's just funny. Although I will say I wasn't a natural communicator and I'm still, I think I'm better because mm-hmm. I've had to recognize progress. I think that's important, <laughs> but also aspirations is, you know, I have higher aspirations of being even more of a factual communicator. And, nice. But, um, I did the exact same thing when I was coaching and I tried to get, communicate a lesson and it is very hard when it's so natural and I couldn't yeah. quite break it. Down. So then I, I took the same kind of lesson that just happened of like trying to give it. And I was like, that didn't go so well. Mm-hmm. I went on the other court and I started hitting the ball with my left hand. Okay, nice. And then that forced me to see not only mentally what was going on, but also feel the body mechanics. Love it. And we Love don't it. realize when we, when we get so ingrained in a groove, Mm. Just we kind of show not communicate both ways. So yeah, well that's really powerful on on some of the coach education pieces I do, especially when I'm putting people through say a level one or a level two. That's one of the big things. As as soon as I get a good player on a level one or level two, they sometimes make the worst coaches because they can just do it. They're going do what I do, and I'm going well exactly that. And and you going and playing with your left hand is one of the tricks we use when we're coaching coaches. Yeah. Again, especially yeah. good ones. Say like someone's been playing pro for ten years and they want to become a coach exactly that lesson that I learned, but I love the way that, that you went in and figured it out. And on a, I suppose I say similar level, again, lockdown definitely happened a lot, but, but definitely watched hours and hours and hours of squash, you know, and just watching it, slowing it down, going frame by frame by frame. And again, I just got in a good habit over the years of collecting best in the business type shots or best in the business type movements just on my phone, on my iPad. So if I was giving a lesson, I could very quickly show it myself. I'd get the player to do it. I might even film them, but then I'd back it up with one layer more of going, okay, right, let's look at this frame by frame by frame. And would you do it side by side, like pro and then... And yes, the- yes. Okay. there's an app called Coach's Eye, which is brilliant. So I could hit that shot and then I'd get the, the student to hit the same shot. We can compare it and draw on it. And then you could also, the pro one is not as easy because obviously how it's filmed as a pro, it's filmed from the back. Yeah, the court, but- as I said that, I was like, they're, they're down. Yeah, like if you get the iPad on the court and set it up with a tripod in a certain area, it's brilliant because you can get the same angle for the same shot. And it's a real powerful tool. But, you know, it, most of us are visual learners. You know, we are really good visually learning. And so I think when you can, back up again like i was talking about communicating the point well whether it's a a backhand drop a forehand lob but then back it up with the video you know for me as a coach that's a real powerful layer to put in and again on the on the app with squash mind there's there's a whole section that's going to grow called video guided visualizations where you watch a two minute little clip on whatever ali farag's backhand movement and backhand volley and then you go into a deep visualization really replaying that in your mind so it it just takes that visual learning and just embeds it a bit deeper in the brain as well i do think that well especially if you're going through the effort of communicating it and one thing that i think is a weakness in our sport and i'm guilty of it because i didn't do it when i was a coach but people do all learn differently but i think you Mm -hmm. also need to reinforce in different ways so visual on court slowing it down video visual but then also um written like what should i feel and i (laughs) when i would get a golf i picked up golf a few years ago I wrote down both like what to do, but also how it should feel. Cause I was like, yeah, ah, how that translated to me. It's like, you know, elbow leads. Mm-hmm, yes. And, and Mo, I think that's great. Like the more there's a, a really amazing book called make it stick. It's all about how we learn. It's, it's going mm-hmm. from children to adults called make it stick. And it, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. And I've learned so much from that. So what you're saying there, this is something I, I do quite a lot with the squash mind training. When I run some training things, really big on journaling and reflecting. So I get a lot of players to journal and reflect. And and the fact that they've written it down, especially written it down with pen and paper, not just popping it on their phone, because yeah. again, there's some really interesting scientific benefits. The tactile, yeah. Tactileness and, and the way yeah. it embeds stuff into your neurons in your brain. So yeah, you saying that about golf is, is such a powerful and, and I think very underrated tool in regard to that deeper learning. And and on that, what I actually challenge my players to do a lot linked to this book called Make It Stick is come up with analogies. Like when you get analogies and whether it's the coach to the player or the player talking about analogy, you know, the most classic one is skimming the stone on the forehand, right? You, You get the dynamics of skimming a stone, but I really like to go a lot deeper with analogies and just little phrases. So if I'm coaching someone, I actually get my players to try to come up with them themselves. It's a really powerful exercise and anchoring. 
yeah, anchoring. And then, and then I can just mention one of those words and that analogy. Ah, right. You know, whether <laughs> with a classic backhand, where the player does that kind of that swinging wrist, where they they bulge their wrist in the wrong direction. You know, I call it the rusty swinging gate. You know, it's kind of because you're not cocking your wrist. You're basically just like swinging your wrist like it's a gate in the wind. And you know, me, I'll just say gate, for example. And ah, oh, the player like right. I've just done it again. So yeah, actually, the power of analogies is really good. But I love writing yeah. it down, and it's storytelling, isn't it? I think good coaching. Is about good storytelling. If you can tell the story well and take your players down a path, so to speak, that's a really big skill that I encourage coaches to do a lot. And, and look, it takes time. Like, you know, when say you've coached or you've received lessons, you can probably remember some of the stories more than the actual technical details of said thing you're working on. And yeah, I've, I've had players come to me, you know, whatever, 10 years later going, oh, I remember that whole elephant trunk thing we talked about with like the backhand lob. You know, if you're in the front, you're trying to get the elephant trunk spraying water on the back. You know, it was like a silly passing comment, but it stuck with that player for, you know, 10 years later, which is really interesting, I find. I completely agree. And I think uh, it's interesting as I try to become a better, and I still am because it's in the communication and perform. I'm hyper focused on performance and this is why it all, Yes, I'm deploying it in the field of business these days, but it roots back to how I developed as a uh, as a squash player, frankly. So, nice. You're linking performance to your play. Like, it's quite an interesting question. That, like, can I well ask you a question because that for me is quite interesting, and that's that's the challenge I have with players quite a lot. Is going yes, they want to achieve things in their game and they want to perform at the highest level, but. I think we're very aware of the youth dropout in sports, you know, this whole idea about pushy parents and really pushing, pushing, pushing that you lose the joy and the love and the reasons why you're playing. Can you talk on that a little bit of interest? How how did you find that journey as a, as a junior? Yeah. You know, I was fortunate enough that my parents were, didn't push me towards anything. Actually, the irony was uh, when I was living in London, so young age, you know, six, seven, my dad kept trying to take me on a squash court. Okay. Interesting. And I remember going down, you know, the, I'm going to say quarter. Yeah, the coin, yeah, the pound yeah, coin. The coin, and the coin the and turn on the lights. Two parts was one, I couldn't see in when he was playing. So like I missed okay. out on this total, what was going on in the game. But then mm-hmm. after his match, he brought me on court and trying to get me a hit, which is, it's comical seeing other parents do that who don't mm-hmm. know how to coach, right? And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, a good experience. And a lot of this is experience. It's all about experience. Yeah. Did you enjoy your first lesson is the biggest thing right yeah of why you come back to the lesson number two and then lesson three and then there's different reasons why you can enjoy the experience it could be friends mm. it could be social massively so there's a variety of reasons anyway mm. so they kept trying to push me to go to squash didn't and then i get to high school needed a winter sport and there it was nice but when i so i hadn't played in years and i literally hit my first ball and i was like i like this right and so that was it you got it yeah and i was fortunate that all the avenues i pursued were my own choosing and and going. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I think there's an element of you want to be a pull, not a push. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I'd be curious about your aspect here, though, because sometimes we need to be motivated and that's where a good coach can do that. But so how how do you delineate between knowing when to push someone and Mm -hmm. also like when let it be self-driven? Yeah, great question. I definitely, I hate to say this, but I've definitely put a lot of people off the game. I would almost say to the point of when I was a young coach and really getting into it. And again, it was probably the, the, I was still in the pro mindset for my own personal development. I was going, right, well, I'm training like this and I'm pushing. So when I would turn up at a school and coach a group of kids at a school, if they weren't really buying into what I was doing or they weren't pushing themselves, man, I would, I would get really upset and, and really go harder and then you know make them do course sprints. And it was looking back and I'm going, that's horrendous coaching. Like what, like why? I just didn't understand the athlete. I didn't understand the reasons for them being there. And again, it's another massive skill of a coach to really get that relationship right with your player to really understand their reasons why they are there. And I think that for me is is the crux of it is, is you know what, there's people I coach, there's a girl I coach today. Honestly, she just loves to be there, laugh, have a chat. We take the mickey out of her. And then the next thing she's off and then I've got a pro coming on straight away. And like my whole mindset has to completely shift. And again, it's a skill you hone over time. It's about you as a coach being adaptable, being flexible, putting on so many different hats and lenses and seeing it through their eyes. And yeah, I, w- I would say most coaches go through that that phase where, <laughs> you know, you, you definitely put people off a game. And my goal now, and is, is a few of my prouder coaching moments, look, if I create a 
a junior champion or someone who's ranked really high in the world, great, that that's fine. But that's actually not my philosophy. My philosophy is, could I introduce someone to the game that, that it becomes a complete part of their life in the future and they give back to the game? And I'll give you a quick example. So one of the juniors I coached, I met him when he was 14, 13, 14, you know, massive anxiety issues, had no self-confidence, would, you know, hit one bad shot and almost be crying in tears. Fast forward 10 years, he is my lead junior coach at my club and he's influencing 70 or 80 juniors. He is the most outgoing, confident, positive dude. And I've got so much respect for him. And going from this idea where, and again, I had to really nurture him for many years, you know, just slowly. But every time I had a lesson, he just got that little bit of spark in his eye, that little bit of confidence. And again, that for me is I'm more proud that he circled all the way back, gone to university, rejoined our club, and he's now my main assistant coach. And he's now the role model for a whole generation of new kids. And they kind of want to be him now, which for me, if coaches can plant those seeds and give that to their players and how then they can pay it forward and influence the next generation, that for me, I'm so proud. And, and again, quick little example. The current 14, 15 year olds he's coaching, they now want to become coaches already. They're going, where's the level one? I want to do my level one because what you are giving me, like these 15 year olds and what you're giving me and the joy and experience you're giving me, you know what? I want to give that back. So maybe looping back to your question was, how do you know the difference between someone, you know, performance wise who wants to push and someone who wants to just enjoy it? I think that kind of reveals itself over time. Yes. But I guess the question is, you know, sometimes like, so my, th- it was an example of my parents, they were kind of like suggesting, by the way, this was very low pushing. Okay. So it's like, at what point does someone recognize this talent? Like, look, this player is really good about, he doesn't know it yet, or she doesn't know it, but he or she's going to love the sport. I just need to make sure to help close that gap. Right. And so it's, at what point are you removing excuses and helping facilitate it versus like really causing more misery? So that's, a, that I think is a tough thing. And Mm, it is. It, it, and it's a, it's a constant checking in, isn't it, with that player? I think it'd be pretty obvious if the player's turning up two or three times a week and, you know, just continually got that joy for what they're doing. You know, it's obvious that they want to be there, first of all. And then it becomes the conversation of going, actually, what do you want to get out of the game? Are you looking to take it on at a high level? Or do you want to get into a college for squash? Do you want to go pro? You know, are you playing in junior tournaments? Are you putting yourself in really tough situations? You know, and as a coach, if you can open those doors or not even those doors, but but open the curiosity to that side yeah. of it. And if then the player steps into it going, and again, I'll give you an example. One of the kids I was coaching today, you know, just about to turn 18 and again, had that conversation with him when he was 15 going, you know what, junior tournaments, do you want to get out there? I didn't even mention again, all of a sudden he comes to me a few weeks later, he goes, right, these are the next six tournaments I've booked into, did it all himself. And that for me was an amazing sign that he was the one who then took ownership of booking into the tournaments, telling his parents where they were so they could organize the hotels, blah, 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 all that. And for me, then then I was like, brilliant, you've shown me you want to take it on to the next level. So then we get into different conversations about, you know, about goal setting, training plans, training ideas. What are we doing for our diet? What are we doing for our mind? So yeah, I think that's the coach needs to spark curiosity. I, I think that's a really interesting way to look at things as a coach. If you can spark curiosity and then the player takes the ownership of that curiosity and shows you that they want to go with it, you've got a really good person to work with. Where, you know, talent is a really interesting word you use. And, and again, it's, you know, there's a whole debate about nature, nurture, talent, like is talent more important than efforts? And, you know, that's a whole other probably podcast to talk about that I'm super interested in. But because I think, yeah, when you're rewarding talent rather than rewarding work ethic, that's a very different conversation. Well, process versus outcome, right? So. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. So yeah, you know, if you, you can have one of the most talented ball strikers or talented players, but you know what, again, that it's the whole famous Carol Dweck study where, where they were talking about growth and fixed mindsets and they praised a bunch of youngsters doing maths uh, equations. They praised half the group saying, oh, you are so talented, you are so clever, you are so natural. They praised the other half of the group for work ethic. They were saying, well, I, you worked really hard on that and your effort was great. When they came to ask the same question six months later of the kids, do you want to choose a difficult or an easy maths problem? All the ones that were praised for talent said, no, they want the easy one because they wanted this idea of they were self-fulfilled, that they're clever and they can achieve it. And the ones that were praised for effort chose the hard one. But what was even more interesting, one more thing they did on that study was then when they asked the students for their results, the ones that were praised for talent, as in the fixed mindset group, they actually lied about their results because they couldn't take this idea of, 
oh, we're, we're less than what people think. You know, people were, that group that were called the fixed mindset that were praised for talent had this concept of themselves as people who, they, they were more worried about the opinions of others. And I, I use this, I use that lesson a lot with my coaching, you know, yes, and squash mind, but also with, with my players to really make that conscious effort to not praise talent, but praise effort and the application to it. So yeah, I think that's a big point to make. Yeah. And I think like I quickly said, process versus outcome is because we can't always control the outcomes of what happened, but if we can put effort into the process mm. and actually make that the meaningful journey, so to speak, the outcomes will come and it's way easier said than done. Oh uh, yeah, definitely. Having that is sort of a North, your North star. But that's again, linking to squash mind and the, the, the gym of the mind, the training that I'm really passionate about. You know, we break it down into three tiers when we're doing goal setting. So goal setting for me is a really interesting thing because I don't think I've ever been really taught very good goal setting, but over the years, I think I've borrowed from loads of different good areas. And, and so just to link to this whole controllable, you've got your outcome goals on the top, which you have, what I define as you have zero control over outcome goals. You've got, let's accept you've got no control over the outcome. You've then got underneath that your performance goals, which you have some, but not full control over. You might have some influence on your performance goals, but the layer under that is your process goals. And that's the ones that you've got full control over. Those are the ones that you say on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm doing a 5k run on Tuesday, Thursday, I'm playing these matches and becoming i've re recently written quite an interesting blog about perfectionism and so many people get the idea of perfectionism for the outcome for the result but in my opinion it's about being a perfectionist in the processes if you are really going right if i'm going to dedicate any form of perfectionism dedicate them to the process goals get dedicate them to the things you can control and that it's such a most people most juniors especially get that completely the, the other way around they want to be a perfect player. They want to win these tournaments. They want to get into the national team, but you've got no control over that. You know, what you focus on those controllables. So yeah, just, just reinforcing what you said there about those controllables. And, and again, I, that's what I, I love trying to introduce players to that whole concept and how you look at it in a slightly different lens can completely change how people train and enter tournaments. It can take pressure off them. It can, it can keep them in the moment more often. It can keep them centered back into their processes, which again, I think we both know the power of the mind and what it can do in regard for your, your outcomes. Yeah. And these are the things I think this is the gap and I do want to get into kind of an example, but let me set it up quickly because I think we're identifying that this is the gap between performance in general mm -hmm. so and there's when we look at whether it's tennis tour squash tour we obviously know it's like the delta is like they're all pretty physically fit mm -hmm. so what is it that allows the top players to excel and really it's putting themselves under mental pressure but also then when to how to really drive themselves towards that consistent performance i think golf is like how those guys do mm -hmm. that is the choice yeah, it's crazy well like like within golf is probably a great example for this but but squash as well at a certain level you know give or take a few percentage everyone is pretty much the same physically speed exactly you know what right. golf is even more magnified isn't it because you can set up the same there's a lot of controllable factors yes there's maybe conditions and, and pressure but probably the you know and it is amazing that going right what's separating you know the people that are sustaining top 10 in the world over 10 years it's got to be the mind, you know, and, and, you know, we, you hear sports psychologists talk about it. it is, it is literally, that's the difference. And just on, on a quick side note here, that's pretty much, I was lucky enough to be asked by England squash, but also I did it with the university of Gloucester. I did a master's degree in regard to mental toughness and squash. And it was a, a research project. And that was the big thing that came out of it was that whole idea of, I read so many papers and I basically summarized it in one paragraph about this whole idea that within reason that the percentage difference physically, technically, tactically, tactically was a bit of a gray area, but physically and technically within top performing sports people was the most negligible thing. It was all the mind. So yeah, it reinforces your point there, I think. We're gonna take a quick break to hear a word about our sponsor. So Lee, we wanna thank you for being our first sponsor on Squash Radio. And just want to say you've sponsored other avenues, but squash is always where your heart's at. What does it mean to you to be sponsoring squash? I, I think there's just a, a lot of interesting people in the sports. I've attended junior tournaments. I've been to professional tournaments. 
and you can always get into some engaging conversations. And I think Squash Radio is an avenue of bringing those people to the forefront. And I'm sure a lot of people would like to listen to them. And sponsoring this, we're just uh, facilitating that. I think you nailed it. Is there anything else you, you might want to add? But I think you, you nailed it. That is, <laughs> that's exactly what I think. Because <laughs> I'm in like with Hope. I've met Hope so many times and they've got into a little bit of conversation. But listening to that conversation you had with her, just, she's just a squash through and through person. And I don't know how many listeners you get, but it doesn't matter. It's the fact that people can now relate to Hope as this person. Hopefully they're going to do that with me. I'm sure, because I'm quite a private person, I'm not, I've never been a person who hung around the squash circle of people. But when I do, I've got some very good friends and they will probably know me, but there's a lot of people who saw me at junior tournaments and a lot of my juniors were top players in the country. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's a great way of bringing some of the personalities from squash. That was Lee Witham, who is the CEO of Pro Sports LED, the sponsor of this podcast. You probably don't even think about lighting and neither did we until we started talking to Lee. And now we totally get the problem that Pro Sport LED is fixing. And we know maybe that's not you now or maybe not you ever. But if you know anyone who might be interested or need to improve their lighting for squash, tennis, soccer, you name it, it would mean a lot to us and our sponsor if you'd put us in touch. You can go to squashradio.com slash LED or email squashradio at gmail.com. That's squashradio at gmail.com. Thank you again, and back to our show. So, and believe it or not, we're going to go deeper on this topic. If you, we were just scratching the surface here, because let me try and drill down on some specifics. But here's my quick preamble. Okay. Because I think someone who's listening to this, and um, you know, let's let's say they're in their 30s or 40s or 50s male or female, and they're like, look, that's for, I get it for the pros, but that's not for me. So that's who I'm going to be speaking to right now. Of, I actually think this is for everyone. Mm-hmm. And our preamble here is that working out in the 60s wasn't really a culture thing, mm-hmm. right? So we've had an adaptation of culture of like in the 80s and 90s, it became like, you need to go work out. Yeah. Certainly in the 20s, now there's like, everyone can do it. And there's such an increased variety of how to do it, yeah. you know, with CrossFit there and like really taking people from all walks of life. So anyway, if we have now culturally accepted that we should be working out and there's lots of different ways of doing it, I don't think the culture behind really tapping into our mind and the mm. average person on a day-to-day doing this, I can speak to my point of view. The more effort I put into understanding this attack, when it, the dividends are not just 10x, it's like 100x. Mm. Yeah. So here I'm going to have you walk through the scenario of like a club player Mm-hmm. So you got to, they're the skeptic potentially, or am I getting that? We call that here in the U.S. We call them. Yeah, yeah. Club players, club players. Club players, you know, let's say 40s or 50s. Mm-hmm. What's the pitch and how are you walking them through why this is important? Yeah, no, good stuff. Just to pick you up on your first point there, I, again, I heard an amazing podcast, very similar lines to what you talked about, the acceptance of the physical side, you know, everyone knows physically, but yeah, 60s, 70s, maybe late 70s, 80s, people are getting more aware of it. Gyms, how easy it is to just get on. You can download a hit program at workout at home. You know, Apple, Apple one or Apple plus have just brought out their new fitness thing. It's just everywhere. It's so easy. And the podcast was talking about that. He says he feels we're at that tipping point now that people are much more aware of the mind and the power behind it. And he's believing in the next 15 to 20 years, there's going to be as common of a working process for our mind as it is physically. And for me, that's super exciting, you know, jumping onto the the squash mind thing and, you know, launching it a a month, a month or so ago, you know, maybe my timing is pretty good. So let's, uh, let's look positive onto that. (laughs) The other trend that's coming on is there's what I would call like, there's micro leaders or it's very specific niche leaders, right? And Mm -hmm. it was an unlock for me that even just hearing you about this concept was, I had heard about this. I've tried meditation, tried a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. Literally, I'll, I'll sign up for this because you get squash players. Yeah. Right. Like for me, now the gap is way more reduced that you can help me navigate that area versus I was going in blind by myself yeah. and getting foundation. So I think mm. understanding communities, right? So this is a squash community. And then who is it? The nice part, because of digital, you can be, mm-hmm. I love it. What, uh, 
the coach in your pocket or the coach yeah. in your ear. I don't know yeah, if I made that up. It. Yeah, coach, coach in your pocket. That's one of my strap lines. It pretty much is. It's, it's meant to be super accessible, super easy. I'm trying to reduce the friction for practicing for the mind. You know, that that's where I'm going to get onto your club player situation in a bit. But that's, yeah. if, I'll just transport myself into when I was playing pro as well. I did see sports psychologists. I thought they were very useful. The one downside was I would see a sports psychologist once every two weeks and I wouldn't touch base with them again. So you know what? There was a big reliance on me just doing it myself and they were good. But but the other thing that I found and, and hence the birth of Squash Mind, I didn't find that that it was grounded with as much theory and understanding. So what I like to do with anything I do with Squash Mind and, and going in visualizations or mindfulness, I really try to back it up with the reasons why we're doing it, what parts of the brain are being affected, the impact it's having on our lives. And I think once the education piece becomes stronger and it is becoming stronger because, you know, TED Talks are great. We are understanding you get some real influential people talking about their, their morning routine or their, their mindfulness practices. So I think a lot more people are paying attention to it. So what I do with Squash Mind is I try to use all those lessons, bring them together for the education piece. So, and this links to the whole club player idea is going, you know what? I think when players are more educated, there's an easier buy-in. So it's coming at it from two areas. It's coming at it from a, a less friction, your coach in your pocket. The app is, is from free of charge to download. You get quite a lot of free lessons. And the yearly subscription, I think, is relatively cheap. It's, it's 40 pounds a year. It's less than one session for a sports psychologist, you know, so and you get a whole year's worth of every single lesson on the app. So it's trying to reduce the friction. It's trying to reduce that idea of, oh, well, I've got to go book in to see a sports psychologist. I'll see them. It might be expensive. They'll give me stuff. They'll just tell me to go away and work on it. You know, if you're not the most motivated, intrinsically motivated person, you're possibly not going to do that, are you? So that's the one point. And then the, the education piece, I think, is another one. So there definitely is resistance. So I'm not going to lie and turn around going, hey, everyone I've spoken to about this in their 40s, 50s is, is jumping on this bandwagon. But saying that, the conversations I've been having over the last year, this is before Squash Mind, you know, during a lesson, I can see someone, I can see someone's there, they've glazed over, they're not there. And I, I just go, is anything up? Is anything wrong? And, and they'll talk about it. And whatever it is, all these distractions, external stuff, but I'll give them little tools to bring them back into the moment on the court. And again, this is another reason Squash Mind was born was going, I was giving these really good lessons and I like almost like a sports psychologist, like some of these squash sessions would turn into a psychology session, but it would stop there. The play would go away and they'd probably work on it for a couple of weeks, but there was no continual touch point. There was no continual, right? Oh, let me just check in with the app, with whatever it was. But Saying that, the players I've worked with more closely over the last year or so in their 40s and 50s club players, they are actually asking some really interesting questions of me now. They're coming on and they're going, oh, you know what? Or, or they're telling me, they say, I was a lot more mindful when I was driving here today. I felt the tactility of my steering wheel and I was I was in the moment. And actually, and then when I was driving, I was really thinking about the lesson we want to do. And for me, that's gold. All of a sudden, all that, that player now is not being reactive. They are cultivating a certain mindset and a certain way of looking at things that's really positive so yeah that would be how i think over time and it's not going to be a quick thing how the acceptance of working on the mind is going to, going to come to the fore i was going to say i think one thing to and i'm still struggling with how to kind of like get someone from zero to one right and so something that jumps to mind for me is like if you think that you want to work out then try doing pushes right don't look at the theory of it because you could study it day or learn but like until you get down on the ground and do a push-up and see what it, and by the way then you did 10 okay try 20 but then mm -hmm. do it for two minutes. yeah and so like really give it a go don't just try once and mm -hmm. you know i wonder what that threshold is is like try yeah. this for seven days and i think i i would encourage really think about that from a I, so i i'm kind of reversing it here like mm -hmm. i'm fully bought in i've done this not yours specifically but worked mm -hmm. on the mind and it's paying high dividends so yeah. it's like how do we get to come along and i think it's like what's the yeah. seven day challenge the 10 day challenge and nice yeah well no you you've just given me a really good idea to probably cultivate you know that whole idea of because what squash mind has slightly evolved with more recently i'm doing a lot more education pieces so again a massive shout out to to phil wilkins in the states he's really connected me with some good families david ames at vassar college i'm actually doing every week i log on to zoom calls and we do education pieces and i give them tasks i go right we're going to do this we're going to do that that's where the app doesn't have anything at the moment. But what you said there, I think I think that's a really, really good touch point is going, yep, you know what? The app, people download it, give it a go. 
But how can we do that, that what you said, 10 day, 14 day challenge to go, right, here's your, your checklist for the next 14 days. You know what? Commit to this 14 days. You know what? If it doesn't work, you don't like it. So be it. But yeah, the, you don't, you got to do it, right? You can't yes, just say. It. Yes. Yeah. That, that's, so that's where I think uh, this is where I, I'm so excited where the app can go and the whole process can go because lucky enough it's me at the moment i've got full autonomy on it i've got a great app designer i could do whatever i want with it and having these conversations really inspires me because exactly that i'm going that that has been quite an interesting bit of feedback since the app launched you know six weeks ago is yeah the downloads are good people are using it but it then almost takes again like we said that motivation for someone to keep going back to it yes it's really easy to use as you've probably seen like it's all laid out clear but actually, it still takes a little bit of an effort to go and do it. How can I make it where there's even less effort for that to happen? Whereas, you know, that's where the education pieces with Bill Wilkins, the families, the Vassa College, there's actually a couple of interesting colleges and people I'm speaking to about stuff in the new year, which is exciting. Okay, that's, they know on Wednesday at 4 p.m., they log on with me. That's great because they've got that accountability. But yeah. the, the key is how can someone be doing this without having to log on to a Zoom call and speak with me about this? Sure. So, no, I, th I think you've touched on a really interesting point here. So, yeah, watch the space is what I'm going to say. So that's okay. definitely a great little seed you planted. Thanks. It really is going to be then. I think it's we're going to see um, a whole different mind shift, you know, just yeah. recognizing it. So just, just, just one more point to pick up on, on the club player and and. Obviously, everyone's busy. I, I get that. And for me, I've got that concept. And, and it, I like what you said, taking someone from zero to one. You know, two minutes of mindfulness is infinitely better than no minutes of mindfulness than zero. You know, two minutes is infinite compared to zero. And that's that's what quite a lot of the app has. It has these micro meditations and these small lessons. It has a pre-match section, which is three or four minutes of, uh, right, I'm playing someone who's a retriever, someone who runs. And it just gives you a three minute lesson. You don't even have to visualize. You don't have to close your eyes and it will just remind you or prompt you of the key aspects tactically, what you need to do against that player. So I yeah. think even in the short term, if people aren't diving into, you know, deep visualizations, just having a three minute touch point, whether it's even in your car on the way to the, the match, you know, you just stick it on and you just, <laughs> hopefully it's not a, a droning voice, but you hear my voice in the background telling you about, right, this is your plan. This is your tactic. You know, and, and then people go on, they turn up and they start performing better. Again, I think the buy-in will start to become stronger because of that as well. So it's trying to cover, like you said, a lot of bases going, right, yes, there's sections for busy people, people who are rushing around, but there's, again, a lot of the juniors, they really into the, you know, 15, 20 minute deep visualizations. We set aside certain times of it. I really give them a program of it. So yeah, I just want to make that final point for that, that club player where I, again, it's reducing that friction. I keep saying that, but I think yeah. that that is an important point. Well, I think that's friction in terms of like how to practice it, how to learn. But one thing I will say though, is this is not easy. It's as if you would go on to the driving range for, for squash, you know, never touch a racket, like don't expect to be good. So yeah, Expect well, that this is going to be hard. Yeah, but definitely. Time in, you get you get rewards out. It takes time. I'll, I'll give one quick example, which is actually kind of funny. With my my wife, who uh, she's a consultant at Deloitte, has studied leadership, like a variety of stuff. Where it's all improving their consultants. Nice. She got her master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania, studying positive psychology. Nice. Anyway, so she, we're into this stuff, and she was practicing meditation and breathing for a long, long time, and mm -hmm. it just quite clicking wasn't quite working. It okay. turns out. She had a blockage in her nose. No way. So, since she was a kid, couldn't breathe out of her nose. 98% blockage. So wow. think of how much effort goes into, you got to breathe into the nose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I, you can probably correct me on this, but that bypasses, um, that's how you actually catch your breath, not just. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, well, a quick point there. If you're breathing through your mouth, that's emergency breathing. You're breathing because yes. you are running away from the metaphorical lion in the savannah. When you're breathing yeah. through your nose, it's much more diaphragm deep breathing and it goes into a much deeper part of your lungs. I've, I've, you know, I've nerded out about dif different yeah. breathing methods as well. So I, I know how it works. I don't always remember yeah. the size behind it. But <laughs> the same with the surgery. Uh, she got the wow. surgery. And then when, um, I, so I was giving her the, the equivalent. I was like, oh, you've been climbing a mountain with weights. Nice. So then when she yeah. not catch that breath, Amazing. she went in like a uh, half hour long meditations that were so brilliant. 
and powerful, but it was like, cause it was hard. So, but that's amazing thinking about like something physical like that. And then what, how that's almost opened up pathways to the mind. You know, it's just, it's just a fascinating topic you could go so deep with, but just on that one point, when you talk about it's hard again, two bits here, I, I, the, the education piece around visualization, I've got a lot of journals and papers and stats and stuff, but also firsthand athlete experience. And the same with mindfulness, there's amazing studies and, and it's becoming more common. So I think educating people along that is really interesting because, and then the second point is it's all in our, it's in our skull. We don't have instantaneous feedback. If we go and hit a squash ball, we've got instantaneous feedback. If we go to the gym, we've got instantaneous feedback. But when you're working on your mind, you've got very little instantaneous feedback. And that's why I think a lot of people don't stick at it for longer periods because, okay, they do it for two weeks, three weeks, they dip and they dip out. They're going, well, okay, I'm not seeing any results. I'm not seeing my biceps grow bigger, blah, blah. But that's the point of the education as well. Going, yes, it is happening. Those those wires in your brain are re rewiring and they're getting stronger. And it's, it's, it's like, going, like you've got to stick at this. And like you said, you've had a personal experience where you felt it's more than tenfold when you get it right, your wife's experience of that blockage. And I think the more that's a passion thing of mine, the more I can make people aware of this, the more powerful it's going to be in the big run, in the long run as well. I agree. And so there is a, a skill to this, but it's okay. Just, just starting, like you said, is better. You know, one is better than another. Well, just on that as well, I, th I think you almost touched on it. It's all about forming habits, isn't it? If you can start forming this as part of a habit, um, James Clear, Atomic Habits, a really brilliant book. And there's a lot of lessons in Squash Mind based on those habit forms forming. And yeah, he's very big on that is associating it with certain things. So one small example I do whenever I run, I always get back and I always do a three minute, you know, mindfulness, almost or, well, like a, a gratitude meditation. I, I'm grateful to have the ability to go and run. Like think about all the people in the world that can't even physically go and run. They don't have the healthy air. They don't have limbs, you know, crazy stuff. But, and again, I love that idea. If we can start making work in our mind, integrate in our normal day-to-day -day life as a seamless habit, as soon as that habit gets formed, man, that's power. Like then you're talking really powerful stuff. So again, you talking about that 14 day challenge, you know, for me, that's gold. Yeah, it's, it's got to get over that. And, and build on the momentum. What I was going to say was, because here's one of the personal challenges, and I'm, I'm not saying that everyone's going to experience this, but I'm just trying to uh, throw my pebble sort of over there so people can hear. I'm a competitive guy. I'm certainly not the best player in the world at all, which is clear, but um, competitive nonetheless. And so when I started, because I heard about meditation, I'm doing it in air quotes, I was like trying that, mm -hmm. and I found it, I struggled with it. So again, because I was, I kept trying to think win loss, and right. there, there, I that was setting up for the wrong outcome, right? Interesting, yeah, product. definitely. But just to know that there are alternatives, and a guy like Jesse, this is why I think you're, you studied all this in such a wealth of knowledge. Was I went off the the Wim Hof method, which is a nice. method. Yeah, yeah, very aware of it. Yeah, allowing me to really tap into the mind and body at the same time. Nice, and it actually got me into a meditative state. So yeah. Do you want to explain the Winhoff or should I? Yeah, um, I, I probably, you're probably more at it. I'd say I've researched it. I'm curious on it. I, there's a tiny part of me that I've got the app. I've listened to a lot of his stuff. I've not dived in yet. And I actually, I don't know why I've not dived in yet, but please explain because I'm super open-minded and curious for this. You know, with a lot of this stuff is, you know, you should definitely just try it like two or three times. And it mm -hmm. is hard. And there's a whole Winhoff method, which is basically the ice cold stuff, which I'm not yeah. even talking about here. It's just really the breathing technique. Yeah. And there's a, the breathing technique and there's a specific sequence they go through. And so that allows me to really, it gives me something to aim for, but then nice. the byproduct that is like, and you end up holding your breath. So this sounds crazy. I was holding my breath within three rounds up to almost four minutes. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, that's because I've seen, I mean, I'm actually in a WhatsApp group where people are talking about it. It's actually squash players, which is really interesting. And they doing that. They're taking a screenshot of those, the holding the breath. So you were getting up to four minutes. That's unbelievable. That's amazing. That was four minutes within the, the first or second round. So right. it's just interesting. And that allowed me to sort of, yes, tap into that competitive nature that I'm trying amazing. to do. Uh, it gave me something. The way I replace that is like, it's, I like things that can be measured. And yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So even if meditating, you could say my goal is two minutes, right? And give your kind of just be in that space for two minutes, regardless of uh, yeah. How, how well. That's amazing. No, while well, you you've inspired me to get onto because I've heard I, again. I'm not quite sure about the cold shower technique yet. I I get it. I understand it. I believe in it. I get it. And I'm like, yeah. it, 
I'm not there yet. <laughs> so, so, so right, then the breathing one. Right? Yeah. So the breathing one for me sounds interesting because, again, it's probably a good few years ago I really got into breathing techniques and did the whole um, – a bit of research along, you know, what they call dew athletes. It's the Olympic skiers, but they have the rifle on their back. So they do that cross country skiing. They've got to get down and they've got to shoot the target, you know, and they've got to learn to lower their heart rates and control their breathing. It's really yeah. interesting. That, and I was trying to take what those athletes do and transport it into a squash version. You know, you've got 10 seconds between rallies, eight seconds between rallies. What can you do physically, breathing wise, to get that heart rate? Almost back to normal, it won't be, but how can you lower it so you can perform again? But I think it sounds like one has gone to something big there. Oh, that is a really interesting. Again, this is why. Link. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Interesting. I didn't even think about the point under that. Mm. You know, I love learning at so many different cross sections because it's a, you can always bring something back. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, we're going to wrap up this section where we get into our quick fire. But I just want to say, like, again, the stuff you're working on here is is absolutely. I should preface, I actually haven't gone through the app, but I will uh, definitely with the holidays. But I love what you're working on and really right. having someone from the community that is an expert like this. And I know there's others out there, but it's like, let's, we need more people that make this successful. So. No, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. And again, the platform to talk about it here is great. Just a quick, quick, like little point. If anyone wants any more information, you know, Squash Mind on any app store goes there, squashmind.co.uk. I'm sure we'll talk about this at the end as well. But yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> That's what I was going to say is like, give us the kind of like wrap up. And also what's coming down the pike for you with that, right? Like, cause I think already I know the app development world and how to, you know, iterate. So it's like, give a, what's going on. Yeah. So uh, in regard to contact, squashmind.co.uk is uh, all the areas you can get on. Um, Squash Mind on the App Store, dead easy to find. Uh, all on social media channels, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of that is pretty easy. I think everyone knows how to use that. So yeah, again, you just hit me up anything you want to talk about in regard to the future again I, I can't give much away at the moment but there's some really interesting conversations what's happening in the new year in regard to education pieces in regard to working with certain bodies certain universities which is really yeah. exciting so I'm, I'm that's going to be really big in regard to the app itself and how the app is going to develop and evolve Part of me wants to, and again, I'm not sure how this next bit of the app will evolve, but it's actually going to be along the lines of how can I take this visualization and mindfulness onto the court itself? So mm. if you're going to do it solo, if you're going to work on something actually hitting a ball, you know what, can you just pop your AirPods in and, and actually get use and have different sections in the app? for that so so like setting intentions is that well in a way i think also some visualization within the ghosting methods so there'll be mm. like certain ghosting patterns but you you'll have my voice directing you where to ghost but what you're also visualizing I like it. so yeah there's going to be again how how i can almost make like live training programs within the app so people go right I, I'm, I'm at a squash court i'm doing a solo but like you said intentions are a big thing maybe it might be a technical session there'll be a technical point to it and really walking you through that so yeah it'll actually bring a more of a maybe a hands-on practical approach to it which which again i'm not sure how it would work yet but i will research it and how that all yeah. all, all starts to fold in but yeah I've, it's exciting i didn't think it would be picked up as much as this again over in the states it seems like people are loving it at the moment which is great and again i can't speak highly enough and thankful wilkins he's been the the real into there and really got me to speak to some very interesting people and yeah the stuff in the new year could be really really cool and it could could start taking up quite a lot of my time which i'm excited about and yeah i might have to do less time on court and more time on on calls like this which yeah happy days for the time being I mean, I would, it would be better for the community if that was true, right? It's a, it's a way to scale it. Yeah, definitely. So. And that's, that's, I think it is relatively scalable. There's again, big picture plan would, would almost to be, you know, to get more coaches qualified in regard to the squash mind philosophy, you know, like, like actually running training programs, you know, like a, you know, six week course in regard to visualization for coaches to pass on to their players. Yeah. You know, I think, I think this could actually scale quite big in the next five to 10 years, possibly. Well, and that's the same way that I think the coach's responsibility is to help bring out the enjoyment for the player. Exactly. Right? And the enjoyment can also be, you know, performance on that. But anyway, we have to go learn about body mechanics, strength training, nutrition, you know, the mental aspect has been there. But it's really we we need to be versed in all these things, even if we're not a hundred percent the expert. So I think you're a hundred percent right that this needs to be 
and it's fun to like get a new, new mm. something new toolkit, right? Yeah. And, um, awesome. Well, yeah. Hopefully, yeah, we can have this chat. Uh, I'm sure we'll have more chats, but maybe if we have a five year kind of let's set the state in five years time and, and see where it's at, could be could be quite interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I like. It. Well, we're going to transition a little bit into the quick fire section. Okay, and cool. uh, what I liked was there was a guest recently who uh, sort of brought out like, hey, in the quick fire, could I talk about squash a little bit? And I thought that that was, hey, for a squash podcast, yeah, Barbie, I should have had a quite a <laughs> So thank you. And that was uh, Lee with him, also our sponsor, uh, Pro Sport LED. So quick shout out. So two sections here. One is the standard kind of... Uh, questions I ask all the guests, but we're going to go through the squash portion of this where I give you a topic Mm -hmm. and I get 90 seconds on the clock, so to speak. And it's going to be uh, major areas of the sport. And I'd love for you to just say in either order, what you want to see improved about that area and also what you really love. Okay. So this is, we're challenging the full coach in you here, Jesse. (laughs) So what I love and what what I want to see improve. Okay, let's do it. So the first topic is professional squash. What I would like to see improve, maybe a super obvious one, more more eyeballs, more eyeballs on the game. What I love, I love the openness of the game at the moment. I love the the characters. I love I love what's being put onto TV. So it's both. It's kind of the same answer, I suppose, but more eyeballs and more people that don't play squash accessing the game. Well said. Uh, didn't even need the full ninety seconds. He was already coming oh, sorry, back. I, on. Thought, I thought there was like loads of questions. Sorry, <laughs> I do, but I'm just saying oh, you have. Okay. Oh, sorry. So I, I thought there was multiple questions within the 90 seconds. Oh, oh, no, right. no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll expand more on the next one. Yeah, no, but I, what I liked about this is like, you know, when you're playing a match and then yeah. the person either doesn't leave the court or comes on really quickly, and like that's an intimidation factor. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> anyway, so this is actually, this will be interesting because I don't know how familiar you are with it, but here in the United States, college squash is just a huge part of our uh, culture and experience within the game. And we've been fortunate enough that so many people from around the world, men and women, have come to spend their college years here in the, in the U.S. So mm-hmm. the topic is college squash. And okay. even if you're not familiar, I'd love your perspective because that's a whole perspective that is interesting. So please go. I've had maybe a slight touch on this. Um, a few of my fellow Zimbabweans, Simba Muwati, Sean Johnson, Kim Paltiman, um, Pamela Saunders, people I grew up playing squash with went through the college system there. I'm um, Sean Wilkinson, Ian Robinson, Siobhan Knight. I, I'm probably forgetting someone, so if I, I apologize. So I've heard it secondhand experience from them. Uh, love Paul Asianti's book, Run to the Raw. So I've had a touch point there. Uh, again, lucky enough, I've mentioned that I'm, I'm started to work with Vassar College. I know they're not necessarily Ivy League, but they are experienced in the college squash system. So, geez, what I love, it sound, again, I haven't been there myself, but it sounds like the match days are phenomenal. The whole atmosphere, the spirit, everything on the match days does sound crazy. And, and my mates reporting back to me, it just sounds phenomenal. There's a tournament in South Africa called the Jarvis Cup, where it's been running for, I think, 75 years. And it's one of the most famous one week long tournaments, teams. It's one of the most intense things. And people love it for the atmosphere. So it sounds like it's a very similar link. There's an atmosphere to match days. What I would like to see improve, again, maybe obviously not fully aware of it, but it's an interesting concept about not being able to train outside of the season or not being able to have that idea or, you know, training or, or touch points with a coach. I don't know if I'm wrong there, but yeah, there certain leagues have different rules, but yeah, there's an element that you're coached there, but then that's also like, you can always find another coach. It just, it yes. just can't. College that one. Coach, right? Okay, interesting. So that's where, again, some discussions with some of the colleges in America and, and the squash mind and going, ooh, is this touching on that, that thing? So again, look, it's big rules from, you know, big, important people and they've had it for years. So I'm not trying to change the rules, but yeah, it, it, just on my own personal little island here, it does seem like, oh, it'd be quite nice to access training of the mind outside of the season as well. So yeah, that would be my two things. And again, conscious I've never played college squash but uh, like an awareness of it from mates and just one quick point on that I, I remember when i first moved to the uk decided to go to the pro tour because i was at a crossroads between harvard and pro so you know uh, satin de bajwa who was the coach there at the time he was really keen to get me across saw me at the british junior open but i was like you know what i'm keen on the i love the pro side i want to i want to do it but in my first couple of years i you know zero money earning zero money from it and i was busy waking up 
a couple hours before training, sweeping the floor in a supermarket to earn a bit of extra money. I would train for the whole day and then I'd have a bar job in the evening and lock up at 11 o'clock for a year and a half. My mates over there, Simba and all of them were, were partying in, in, in fraternity houses and loving life. And I was there slaving away. So that was, that was put in my experience between like 19 and 21 that they were having a grand old time and I was busy <laughs> slaving with it. So yeah, that's my little story on college squash. Got it. Junior squash. And I know you, you, you also might not be as familiar with sort of the culture in, in, the, in the U.S. here. So you can speak way more to what you do know and what your observations are in junior squash in England. Yeah. So what I would like to see improve, I'll start with that one. We've touched on it in this podcast, this over competitiveness. I, I'm a very competitive guy and the players I work with are very competitive. But I'm so concerned that there's a lot of youths are missing out their childhood and the enjoyment of so many different things because they're being pushed so hard in one direction and whether that's because they want to go to college when they go to pro and linked to that there's such a lack of thought that we can borrow from other sports there's like right you're a squash player so you're learning how to play squash i grew up in africa man i was playing cricket rugby hockey golf tennis swimming athletics and then i play squash it was it was like i was borrowing from all these other sports and actually using the strength of other sports so it's twofold quite or twofold answer that i would love to see the competitiveness still stay there i completely get that but if it's not right for that kid and it's been they're being pushed between the ages of 12 and 16 by 17 they're not going to play squash ever again they're going to i'm done i hate this game so that and and then borrowing from other sports so that's what i'd like to see improve and Again, what I love about it, just on my own personal coaching level, is the opportunities it opens up for juniors. The way I've had 13-year-olds join our adult club nights and the way they communicate with others, the way they become, I almost see them growing into proper men and women and and just their, their, their social skills, their interaction skills, the ability for a 13-year-old to be on court with a 60-year-old and tell the 60 year old hey we're doing drop and drive and we're doing this drill i'm really proud when i get my juniors involved in club night and listen if that 13 year old goes on and plays tournaments and becomes a british junior champion that's a little bonus on the side for me it's it, there's actually the life skills and really showing juniors and using squash as a platform or a vehicle for improving those life skills and again i, I feel really lucky that some parents have turned around to me and gone Hey, listen, my child has just blossomed because of squash as, as that vehicle for that. So that's what I really love about the junior squash. Yeah. Maybe some coaches that are more on the competitive side might completely disagree with that, but that's definitely my philosophy where I go with it. Yeah. So uh, the last question in this section, and I'm going to kind of anchor it a little bit, especially given your level of expertise. So it's on uh, growing the sport. And mm -hmm. so what I'd love to do is, uh, and I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, so one area to improve and one area you love. How, mm. So how do you love growing the sport and how are you looking to improve? And I'm talking about more mm. people on court is actually how we grow the sport mm. and or fans. But I think we get fans and that's probably... Yeah. You know. you know what, in, your, in the pre-interview, I love what you were saying about what you do for that game. Oh, the pro shootout, the pro shootout. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, so it might be a similar answer for both, but let me start with this idea of growing the game. I alluded to it earlier. I believe a lot of it's going to come from influential coaches, from coaches who can influence juniors, adults, show them and show them the curiosity, the love for the game, the, the idea where, you know what, I'm only one person, but if I influence a group of 10 people, could five of those 10 people influence another group of five to 10 people. And, and you get that exponential growth. We've got a big philosophy where we try and get our juniors to buddy up or bring a buddy type situation. And as soon as they do that, you know, it's, it's not new knowledge that, but that that is a really powerful vehicle as well, powerful tool. So for me to keep growing the game, I think it's the right coaches, the right people, the right influences in the right places and really empowering those, you know, making those people, giving them like a career path in a way. I think a lot of times, the younger coaches, they don't, they don't get given maybe the right amount of income or the, or the right support or the right um, kudos to be able to grow it. So I think influential coaches is going to be a huge, huge part of it. And then secondly, yes, for the idea of crowds, 
and using squash in the, in the entertainment sport, I'll, I'll speak to the pre-interview, but I'll, I'll repeat it here a little bit. Eddie Hearn, the boxing promoter, snooker promoter, dart promoter, and he's actually taking on table tennis in the new year and he's promoting table tennis and I bet all table tennis players and, and athletes are over the moon. He's doing it. But what I do is I do a pro shootout and, and again, it's trying to do this whole idea of using 2020 cricket. It's the fast version of cricket in the, in the UK. It's 20 overs each and it's just pure entertainment. So when I do a pro shootout, we change the scoring system. We have crowd referees. We have something called power plays where for two minutes, one player can score double points and another player can score no points. They can serve into the nick. They get five serves per game where they can just go for a cross-court nick. Like, so bring you a bit of tennis and going for like, right, you get a big booming serve. You get a serve expert. And, you know, in two hours, we've had probably 16 or 18 matches in two hours, really mm -hmm. short quick matches, loads of different players, loads of different styles. There is a section in there that they all perform a trick shot and the, the highest voted trick shot gets five bonus points. So yeah. for me, that's, that's a really interesting way to try and promote the game. Okay, I'm conscious we might lose the purity of the game, but I don't think we can be as fussy as we have been in the past, personally. We, we might need to have a different version of our game if we want to get it on TV, et cetera. Yeah, it's like, look, if we're an ice cream shop and we're just serving vanilla and chocolate, then mm -hmm. why would we expect that ice cream shop to grow? Right, that's a, that's a perfect description of it. I love that. With different flavors and everyone yeah. can enjoy it. Look, I'm focused on the court. Mm -hmm. Get more things on court. And I think what England is doing a good job of, and I don't know exactly, but it's like, you know, with Squash 57, like, hey, mm -hmm. activity on this is what we care about. Let's get people nice. out. Nice. So two ways I would quickly, because I love your enthusiasm there, but I also want to give my two quick ones, because it's similar to you, but I would say if we truly care about growing the sport, each Squash player's goal is bring five people on a court during that mm -hmm. year. Nice. I have new players. That's it. Yeah. Nice. Then the other part is for coaching. Cause I just, and you probably are, you know, there's such community leaders, but I, I just want to make sure that this doesn't mean you have to be on court with each of these players. It's creating the environment and the experiences for others to enjoy. Absolutely. Yeah. You getting on court one-on-one -on -one and sharing your craft, that needs to be secondary to the experiences and the environment you're creating. Massively. Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head there. That I, I use that word environment a lot. There's a couple of really good books. It's called The Barcelona Way. Um, it's all about Barcelona Football Club and the culture they've created. And I've tried to use models of that in, in my squad club. And a second book called Legacy, which is all about the, the New Zealand All Blacks, their culture. They've got so many interesting concepts about sweeping the sheds is one of their big ones where they've got Dan Carter, one of the greatest rugby players of all time, after training, him and all his mates would sweep the sheds. They would not employ cleaners and they would actually all physically sweep the sheds, keeping people grounded. It is one of the most inspiring books about environment and culture, and no one's bigger than the game. And when you receive the, the All Blacks jersey, you've not arrived. You need to make that jersey, and you need to take it to a next level. This is the beginning. It's not, it's not the end because you've made the Kiwis, uh, made the All Black team. So, yeah, again, I, I, you've hit the nail on the head. Sorry? It's, it's true for the Navy SEALs. I know we hear a lot about their training, but they're like, BUDS is a, is a weeding out process. So yeah, like that. exactly. Yeah, then it's like then you, you learn how to become a seal so yeah, yeah. so no yeah you like i think environment and culture is huge like you said like what that can that coach be a massive influencer or create that environment where people want to come to the facility and play and get on court so yeah no massively supportive of that so the next portion of this um the quick fire is uh and i'm gonna only I'm mindful of our time so i'm just gonna cherry pick a few uh quick one uh favorite documentary Oh, uh, it, it's always changing. <laughs> the, right at the moment, The Social Dilemma on Netflix. You know, again, I think a lot of us have seen it. Again, and I've read a few interesting articles from it. Again, it's just, it's that screen time. It's that every one of these big companies is, is seeking our attention and, and how we can, it links to a squash mind and in mindfulness and going, how can we calm and slow down? So yeah, that would be my one at the moment. Well, and I think, again, it sounds like we're similar that we learn things in different areas and then I kind of piece it together. But what this also highlights for me and what's going on worldwide but again i'm, I'm more concentrating in the u.s just because this is where where i am and I'm, I'm more keep up the things here but i think we're seeing an erosion of shared truth mm, yeah and very true. what what the social dilemma really shows is like the power that these algorithms and these platforms are really influencing us the way we, sh we think and experience life and yeah. i think it's at the cost of lots of things but also the bigger thing is if we we see separate industries that created uh, climate change issues. Mm -hmm. This to me, like a, towards a bigger picture, yeah. uh, erosion of countries. Exactly. 
Cool. Yeah, so I agree. Love it. <laughs> this is going to be an interesting one, and I'm I'm going to slightly make this a two parter because okay. you point out and highlight and demonstrate something that so many people that I've met from Zimbabwe are just some of the most positive people I've ever met. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I to say that, and maybe you know, because it's it's how many have yeah. I met? Then less than twenty. So not a huge sample set. I I acknowledge. But I've met a lot of squash players, and you guys are disproportionately always happy. Nice. So, the question here is, and it could be something or an activity that brings you disproportionate happiness, with the caveat that it can't. You know, we all know family and friends and dogs and pets really bring yeah. us happiness. Mm-hmm. What is something? You know? Yeah, I theorize about why we're so happy and positive. She's like, maybe the sunshine. We were, we were bloody lucky with the sunshine. I think, honestly, the, the, you talked about culture and environment. Wow, I think we were blessed on what we could do, the sport we could play, the freedom we had, the way we could express ourselves, the schooling system. And look, and this was at a time when, I don't want to get too political here, but Robert Mugabe was doing his stuff as well. And, you know, it wasn't the best environment, but man, we were so lucky to what we had. So I think part of it, we were almost like given happiness in a way. I know that's a weird way to put it, but I think in reflection, because we also had it taken away and a lot of us had to move, we were so grateful for what we had. And I think we keep trying to cultivate that. So in regard to your second part, again, I hope this doesn't sound too cheesy or cliche, but it genuinely is. It's, I get so much joy when I help someone, when I talk to them about a certain concept or whether it's a coaching thing, whether it's a technical thing or whether it's something that's a bit more bigger in life. It's that I had a a great chat with one of my juniors, 40 minute chat. He's right at that crossroads of his life, you know, 17 and a half. You know, he was actually talking about, it was quite a deep conversation talking about, you know, experimenting with drugs and stuff. And I was like, Ooh, okay, this is getting quite, quite heavy, but I just felt we, again, we didn't hit a ball and I just spoke to him and I just was really open and honest and just said, you know, this and that, and and this part of life, and this is where I get motivation and joy and, and that. And he came away from that. And, you know, we've spoken probably every couple of days, sending each other Ted talks or going, Hey, look at this mindfulness thing, or, Hey, have you seen this documentary of this? And I'd never got through to someone as much as him, like in my whole coaching career. And it's just such an interesting conversation. And I got, again, I got a genuine amount of joy from it. So for me, I'd get that, that, that real joy and, and that positivity going, Hey, I've had a chat with someone. I've given them my point of view or things I've learned along the way. And they've been massively influenced by it. So yeah, I think, I think that would be one of my things. You know, I don't think if, if I was asked this question, I don't think I would have been able to come up with this somewhat similar th- Theory, but you definitely like I love sparking things in others, right? Mm. And so that's there we go. That's it. There's curiosity, passion, mm-hmm. enjoyment. It's like I'm always trying to create sparks. Mm-hmm. Okay, so TED Talks. Right. I'm gonna give you the scenario here is you're gonna give a TED Talk. However, it can't be for anything that you're known for. Wow, okay. <laughs> okay, so here the scenario could be is either a uh, you have something that you love that you just n- not many people know about you, or what would you be curious about go exploring and then have to give a TED talk about? Mm, great question. I would say, <laughs> again, maybe it's because I'm, I don't know if I am known about it, but my first instinct is, is to do with, do with Rhodesians, Zimbabweans, like the almost like what Mugabe has done to a whole generation, a whole nation of people to actually investigate the stories around both the positive and the negative. So I know it sounds really weird, but actually what happened to all of us in Zimbabwe at the time was terrible and our farms got taken and, and you know, we, my, my, my folks had to flee to South Africa, but what positives did that also influence? What sparks did it create? It, it, you know, I was in the UK at the time and, and how has that influenced me as well? So yeah, again, yes, I'm known because I'm from that country, but I actually think that there's a whole interesting story or collecting stories from the diaspora, the people who have, who have been forced to move away. And again, maybe thinking slightly deeper, this might even be more so a worldwide thing. I know I'm just maybe looking at the lens of, of say Zimbabwe, but maybe a worldwide thing like the people who have been successful and influence other people in a positive way because of the negative situation they've been in. That for me would be a really interesting topic piece. It's, it's like how conflict can shape your impact in the world. I know it's quite a big, heavy topic, but yeah, I think for me, that's a really, could be a really interesting discussion with people. Yeah, I would say, you know, through adversity comes and greatness can be achieved. I think there is an element that you, of grit. You know, I'm Irish. The famine was terrible for us and it was huge, caused a huge migration. It's also then 
a lot of yeah. that sparked a lot of ingenuity and a lot of more uh, prosperous uh, elsewhere. So, yeah, because again, on, on a very very similar thing, I think I can't remember. I think it was Ryan Holiday. He's big into his Stoics, and he talked about which people during crises over the course of history have become successful. So you, you're talking like Disney formed in the Great Depression, Walt well, Disney and did all, you got FedEx forming in the 70s when something else happened. And he just listed all these famous people slash companies that got formed during adversity. And I have really liked that idea. I think, I think there's, and again, I know this is on a very much smaller scale, but that's exactly what happened with Squash Mind is going, hey, there's adversity. I'm Yeah, you're taking it, making it personal and you're passing it right. on. Yeah. yeah. So the last question I'm going to ask is, and it's set from the sounds of it, you must read a lot of books in a year. So what would be a book you would recommend and why? Or what's the book that you give out the most? Mm. Yeah, geez, it depends on the mood I'm in. I, I go from books ranging from it's something called the fourth industrial revolution, which is all about AI taking over to coaching books, to, to books that are all about the philosophy and mindset of coaching. I would say I've already I've already spoken about this book, but I would say Legacy. Legacy by James Kerr. I, I'm gonna have to say two, unfortunately. I can't pick one because then the other one is is Atomic Habits by James Clear. That that for me has influenced so many ways how I look at things. Um and if I could probably give you my top ten and, and I couldn't even narrow it down, but I, <laughs> Why don't you send us the email about that? Um, <laughs> yeah. I'll bore someone to, but actually on the app, I know this is, gets really nerdy, but there's a whole section on the app for talks, lectures, and books and podcasts, all stuff that I've been to. So when, if people are interested to research further, there is a signpost on the app there uh, under the setting section. But yeah, Jay, Legacy by James Clear, because it's all about the culture you try to create for yourself personally and for the people around you. And then Atomic Habits, because it's a very hands-on practical way to form you know, lifelong habits and, and just getting 1% better in a lot of different things, you know, and you, you stack that together. Uh, there's a great story about the British cycling team, Team Sky, and how they did what the whole concept of marginal gains, where they took every little thing and improved it by a tiny percentage, ranging from the nuts and bolts on the bike to employing as someone who would teach the athletes how to wash their hands so they wouldn't spread germs within the training camp, you know, that range of, which is amazing. And, and, and if we can, cultivate habits in our life so yeah that would be my two legacy and topic habits love it cool man well it's it's a pleasure to get a chance to talk with you and you've been already influencing so many people and so it's just exciting to see if you're here now where you're going to be in five and ten years and uh can't wait to see that success coming so no, thanks, thanks and, and again, it's, it's been you know it's just great to to find a like almost a like-minded person you just spark things off with and yeah again for, for what you're doing squash radio and and how you're getting the the message out there and it sounds like you've got some exciting projects coming up you know i think i'm definitely feeling confident that, that we're going to have some more offline chats and 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 bouncing some ideas off each other in the future and yeah maybe we, we'll pull the resources and, and and get squash on that map a little bit more but no thank you for the platform to talk on and and yeah anyone who's keen to to touch base you know where to find me swash minders where you can go and check it out yeah great stuff well thank you so much for your time today and for joining us on squash radio we hope you enjoyed this latest episode but before you leave we just have one quick last message as you know squash radio wants to help tell some of the best stories from squash world but in order to do that we want and welcome your help do you know a person or a story that involves squash that is interesting, funny, moved you, you care about, reflects your passion for the sport? Well, share it with us and let's try and get it out there on the air. You can email me at squashradio at gmail.com or reach out to us on social media. Again, thanks for your time and well, until next time, be well and have fun.